Okay, it's the end of the session. Uh, I am here without Aurora. She's inside. I want to do this out with my mask, so we're doing it outside. And this is Aurora's roadmap to success. Uh, now, basically, uh, Aurora is a dog that I think was trained by somebody who's uh, the old force and punishment based methods before he, uh, she arrived in this home. She was actually uh, reactive about uh, certain. Uh, uh, some guarding of toys and resources. Um, the woman that uh, actually was trying to uh, work with her ended up surrendering to the Humane Society. The Humane Society was thinking about uh, euthanizing Aurora. But fortunately, the guardian here uh, worked at a place that Aurora was in at, at, for daycare and boarding, and luckily they uh, got her out of there. So she is reactive at certain things, and so when I met and I'd like the guardians to repeat this, the greeting that we did outside. So what we did is I had, uh, and you'd have to kind of come outside and, and maybe you set it up for them. Uh, you might want to set that up without, without people coming. So basically, maybe one of you goes outside and leaves the tree trail that I left. So what I usually do is just one, about one in between every, one on every concrete slab or step section or whatever you call it. Um, and then the person sitting on the stump and then basically what I would have you do is leave the trail of treats, lead her up to the stump and put a, a bunch of treats on that stump. And every once in a while, just lead her out there when there's nobody there. So we get her used to it. And this is kind of something I talked about off camera. When I have a dog that doesn't know how to behave during a situation, I make it an easier version of the situation, easy enough for the dog to have, uh, do it, but with a little bit of difficulty, but pretty easy. And then I break it down into individual steps the step one, step two, step three, or I create an easy version of it and help the dog practice the easier version and then I make the next version a little bit harder and a little bit harder. I work my way back up to real world situation. So if we have the dog practice going outside, getting a tree trail and getting led to the uh, trunk or the, uh, the stump, and there's nobody there but there's a jackpot of treats, I've done that three or five times, then I come out and I see a treat on the ground, that's what I'm thinking about. And then after about three or four times, then we have somebody there at the end like I was. Now, when the person's there, the person probably should watch the video. When you're there, you need to have no movement. I was using my phone and I was holding it like this with the phone off so I could use the reflection of the dark phone with no apps or anything displayed to see the reflection of the dog. Direct eye contact for dogs that you don't know can, is very impolite and some dogs will be reactive to it. Um, additionally, trying to pet the dog or a lot of big movements or craziness can also set off the dog. She had a lot of cortisol in her blood. I could tell by that jumpy twitchiness that she had and efficiency of movement. So if she won't take the treats or won't sit down, I want you to do the same thing I had you do. You, you sat down yourself and that helped her relax or you took a couple steps away and then sat down and relaxed. And avoid saying, good girl, it's okay, there's nothing bad or whatever it is, because a lot of times we'll create a command word for the dog to get upset or nervous or anxious. Um, and then eventually when they get to the person, the person is holding still, they should have a handful of, should have one treat in this hand if she's approaching this way and a bunch of treats in this hand. And so you're gonna to need to trust the handlers to make sure that they don't let her run or rush up to you. She should be experiencing the world through her nose. So when she approaches, you wanna hold still when she's sniffing. Don't try to pet her, don't try to look at her, don't try to say her name, just be still like a statue. Let her observe you as much as she wants, sniff you as much as she wants. Um, and then once she's kind of, uh, she'll really be on you, sniff, 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 sniff. When she kind of backs off a little bit, you can try to hold out this hand with a treat. Hold it off to your side and hold it with a flat hand and don't say anything to her. Just try to hold it so it's her, her nose level a little bit lower. Don't hold it up here. And then if she licks it off your hand, great. If she doesn't, just drop it on the floor, on the ground, and you probably have to use the steward's free dried beef litter. And even if she just approaches you, gets it, moves away, approaches you, moves, that's progress. She's approaching you, something good is happening, she gets to go away and she does it all in her own power. Um, after you've gotten, if you can get to the point where you can give her five or six treats, then get, then give her another treat, and then the, when they, you give her that treat, call this the standing treat. So I'm ready to give her the standing treat. So you give her the treat, and then the guardians lead her about a foot away. This person stands up. Standing up can be uh, confrontational or authoritative at times. So just to make sure that we're, I don't think it'd be a problem, but just to make sure the dog takes a step or two away with a treat in its mouth, the human stands up, the guest does. Then we walk, kind of do the same walk that we did. Walk up a little bit, walk across, letting her sniff as much as she wants to. Then take a little, maybe two minute, three minute walk and then come back with the person. So at first, all these people that she's gonna meet are gonna be people she meets outside. Remember the benefits of being outside, unlimited number of escape routes, um, a lot of distractions, and I gotta move around on my own free will. So we're helping her not focus on the person and making some good positive things happen. Um, we should also have the, uh, uh, after she, when she, in between sniffs, have the guest uh, have a treat and just say seats or plots 
uh, and eventually you'll be able to translate uh, and just use the, uh, the English words and sit. So she sits and then they give the treat, then you take a couple more steps, they say sit again, gives another treat. So the idea is she meets him on her own terms in a positive way, then they go for a little bit of a walk together where again their person's not trying to pet her or do anything, or not big movements, not too loud, and then the person starts asking her to do things and when she does them she gets a reward and the person's still not trying to pet. And then after about five or six treats, um, you can try to pet after a treat, but I would give her a treat. And when you do uh, reach to pet her, and everybody should do this, including the guardians here, this is the dog's nose, what I do is I reach, I stop an inch away from the dog's nose. If it turns its head, or lowers its head, or backs away, that's the dog's way of saying, I don't want you to pet me. And if it won't even come to them, even bigger, I don't want you to pet me. So if I reach her like this, and the dog goes like this, and I pull my hand back, the dog's like, oh, he listened to me. I don't have to go to a nip or bark and lunge to make this person move away. I just turn my head and they stop trying to pet me. And then if the dog leans in, then you can reach to start to pet. If the dog backs away at that point, just like humans who are fooling around, the dog can say no at any time and it's okay for the dog to say no and for us to be respectful of the dog and to stop engaging. And the more that that happens, the more trust and confidence the dog's gonna have in that interaction. And eventually it won't turn its head away so often. Uh, all right, now um, also on walks, remember dogs burn more energy on a walk by sniffing. And so uh, the guardians here, we're trying to, like a lot of guardians, we have a, think of it going for a walk for a circuit. I'm gonna walk eight blocks around. It takes me 25 minutes and I get back home. Well, if the dog starts to sniff, you stop, or you get the dog to stop sniffing. You want them to hurry up, because we think of the walking as what burns the energy. But remember, sniffing is not only burns more energy than walking, it's calming and stimulating and relaxing. So now the dog gets to do this uh, on a walk, and when you're doing the walks, if it's not sniffing, go out ahead of time and grab some shredded cheese and put a little, a little bit of a shredded cheese in a section of grass, and then go somewhere else and do it somewhere else. And then lead your dog there on the walk. After a while, your dog starts looking for that shredded cheese. Now it's sniffing the ground. When it's sniffing the ground, what is it not doing? It's not looking for dogs that it considers the boogeyman. So it's creating a positive association. It's a displacement behavior, but it's a nice thing for dogs to do. They should be sniffing. They should experience the word through their nose. We experience it through our eyes. Uh, we also went over some creative forms of exercising. And remember for the sniffing, your apartment complex might be too busy here. So you might want to take her to a park and that way you have, uh, you're in the middle of the park. If somebody's coming with a dog, they're coming from a great distance. So that would be a great way for you to do it is go to the park, let her sniff. It's a nice way to burn energy and put her in a calm, relaxing mood. And then kind of after she gets, you know, 10, 20, 30 minutes of sniffing and just kind of relaxing, let her go where she wants, start walking to where a path of a lot of people are going to be walking by with their dogs. Find as close as you can get to that path where she will take a treat and where she will sit and they're close enough and start doing the click for looks I talked about in the video above. So now you set her up for success by draining some energy. The sniffing made her calm and relaxed and confident. And then you're managing the situation so the other dogs are far enough away for she doesn't be perceived to be a threat and every time she looks at them, she gets a treat. And gradually you'll get closer and closer and closer. But remember, she cannot react at all. No grumbling, no certainly no barking or lunging or growling. If you're doing any of those things, you're too close, move further away and practice again. All the practice has to be the dog being passive and calm. And the dog's behavior might also be impacted by the other behavior. If you have a person walking a dog and the dog's walking a perfect heel and it's very well behaved, you probably get closer than if you have a dog that's going crazy and barking or a family that's got a kid on a scooter or some other busyness. And also on walks and doing the exercise out front, beware if you have the, the maintenance guys out here cutting down weeds or cutting trees down or, or a baby crying or alarm going off. Those are contributing factors. That's going to set your dog up for uh, a failure. So if that's going, if somebody comes out of the weed eater, stop. Walk away. Tell the guy, hey, we're going to wait. Tell your guests we're going to wait a little bit and until uh, this guy gets done because we want to set up the situation and set up the stage properly. Um, also, uh, remember before you do the greeting, exercising can help. Now we talked about some creative forms of exercising. I would recommend you get an, uh, a retractable leash, a heavy duty one, this is the only time I recommend it, and put her on the harness or whatever it is and go to the stairs, show her you have a piece of crack or whatever the tree is, throw it at the bottom of the stairs, she runs down and licks it up, call it Mexico. Right before she, remember, right before she licks up, she hears the command word and then she gets the treat. And then sure, you have another piece, she runs the top of the stairs and you give her another one, but right before she gets the top stair, you say Aspen and put it in her mouth. So Aspen means go up the stairs, Mexico means go down the stairs. Each down up is one, Keep practicing the first time with an empty stomach until she's like, you're crazy, I've been down there 44 times, I ain't going down there no more. We need to know what that maximum number is so we can actually start exercising about 50 to 75% of the maximum number, but the number may be uh, different for different activities. Maybe before we meet somebody, maybe we need 10 up downs on the stairs. 
before we practice quick for looks, we need 20 up downs of stairs. Before we have uh, do trimming of the nails, we need this, or before we do kennel exercise. So there might be different amounts of exercise. The idea is to play around with the quantities and then do the activity and then judge the results and then play and then try it with more or less of quantity and then see how the results were better or worse. And you'll kind of get into a Goldilocks zone of the amount of quantities or number of repetitions. And then you kind of know before a person observes, she needs this much exercise. Before I do a Zoom call, she needs this, that, and the other thing. Um, I want you to start, uh, keep on feeding her on the snuffle mat, but for all meals now, and what I'd like you to do is start moving on the snuffle mat closer to her kennel. So about one to two inches a day, you're gonna put it down one or two inches a day closer to where the kennel is. So it might take you a, a, couple, a week or two, but eventually you get it in the bedroom. It's so progressive, she hasn't stopped reacting or, or stop engaging with it. And eventually you put it in the kennel, she's sticking her head in the kennel, but she doesn't have to touch the kennel. And then she goes in further and further, and eventually she's going in her kennel and eating her whole meal out of the snuffle mat. Remember, the snuffle mat is nice and, oh, nice way to burn some energy. Uh, you can also do some scent games, hiding treats around the uh, room, and every time she licks one up, right before she's about to lick it up, say treasure, booty, hunt, find it, whatever the word is. Um, uh, let me see. Also, you can consider getting her a doggy backpack. They're probably going to be about 65 to 100 bucks. You put bottles of water in it, bags of sand. A lot of dogs, you put a uniform on them, like a service dog vest. They go into service dog training mode. And so for her, that might help her kind of go into a work mode, but also it's going to make the walk more efficient. Now make sure, also make sure uh, sometime you're on a walk, have one of you standing behind her with your camera, film the back of her legs from basically the top of her uh, butt all the way down to the floor. She had a little bit of a weird gait with her back legs. Some dogs, uh, Huskies and uh, whatnot, are, have are proclivity to hip dysplasia. And if that's the case, they might not want you running up and down the stairs. So check with your vet about all these forms of exercise to make sure that they're comfortable. Gentle Doctor is the vet uh, that she goes to who are a great set of vets. And so um, they'll, they should be able to give her uh, give uh, good advice about what to do and what not to do. But uh, setting up for success, and again, thinking about when she's mischievous or reactive, how long has it been since I've exercised her? So remember we talked about maybe you get up in the morning, take her outside to do some business. Then you go to the stairs on your way back in, do Doggy Stairmaster a certain number of times, come in, then while she's recovering, and remember, don't exercise with any food in the stomach, at least 90 minutes after eating before exercising. So she comes in, she's all hot and bothered. She needs 10 minutes to recover after every form of exercise, uh, exercise activity to catch her breath. So while she's recovering, you shower, you do your morning ritual. You get done, you feed her with a snuffle mat. That's essentially two forms of exercise we got her within the first half an hour of her waking up out of the day. Uh, she's going to be nice and chill. She lays down. Maybe a couple hours later, you do uh, the scent games. Uh, something you might want to order her is an Omega Paw Treat Ball. It's an orange ball. It looks like a golf ball. It's about that, that big. About a little bit better than a softball. It's got a hole you can put her kibble in. She's got to use her nose to nudge it. And one or two pieces of kibble will fall out. She licks it up and repeats it. Um, and so it's another nice way to burn some energy. Um, so um, uh, the idea is to come up with the right amount of exercise that sets her up for success. You have to take her outside to walk, um, but we want to try to get her more comfortable uh, uh, and burn that energy before we're doing the activity. Like remember, uh, exercise can help set you up for success. Lack of exercise can multiply and amplify the problems that you have. And we also talked about, uh, let me see, the importance of rules and structure. A lot of us think of rules as a negative, and so we don't want to have any rules for our dog. And that can confuse some dogs into thinking that they need to be in charge of us, and then we don't listen to them. And so they get stressed when they tell us, don't go outside, uh, don't do this activity. I, I don't like the look, way look at that guy in the courtyard. And you go out there and you talk to him. And just like a child who doesn't listen to their mother, the mother gets stressed, same thing happens for the dog. So um, I suggested some rules. The dog doesn't really like being on the furniture. And for dogs, the higher they sit, the more rank or social status they have. So I recommended maybe not encouraging the dog to go on the furniture because she doesn't want to anyways. Now, we have a nice courtyard down here uh, that the dog can come out and sit and look at. And when we do the session, the dog came out and barked at one of the dogs here. Well, what happens? She barks at the dog and the dog eventually moves away or she barks at the dog and then her humans take her inside. And in either case, her barking ended the visual of seeing the dog. So what you might want to do is get like, I mean, for you guys, you might get like plywood or something like that. Or I've seen people do like just get a, uh, if people get big screen TVs or cardboard, put it on the outside of the fence, punch holes through it, take a zip tie, zip it through, the, the, through your, uh, the railing here. So if she comes out and she can't see into the courtyard, she, the barking doesn't work for her. So you can still come out and we can see over because we're taller than she is. But this way it helps her practice, stop practicing, come over here barking at the dogs and thinking it, it, it worked. Um, let me see, we also talked about uh, uh, not being allowed in the kitchen when we're preparing food. 
and not being allowed in the uh, around people who were eating food. There's probably other examples of rules uh, that you can incorporate, so look for those. Uh, remember, rules are not bad, and breaking a rule is like uh, giving an addict a taste of whatever they're addicted to. So don't break a rule to reward her, rub her belly or take her for a walk or whatever it is. Now, uh, let me see. We also talked about premax. Premax are a great way to add structure. Premax means that a less desirable behavior earns you a more desirable behavior. If you're a kid and you do your chores, you can play with your friends. You do your homework, you can play video games or whatever it is. So one behavior that I, nah, less desirable gets me something I really want to do. So basically, I went over how you could do that for your door, um, putting the dog on a leash, preparing your food. So the process is I go to where the leash is, I tell the dog to sit. If it sits, then I reach for the leash. If it gets up, I pull my hand down and I tell it to sit again. If it sits, I reach again. If it gets up, I pull my hand down, tell it to sit. If it sits, I reach a third time. If it gets up, then I drop my hand again and say sit. And then the fourth time I reach for it, the dog gets up, I just drop my hand, I look at the dog and the dog usually will, is gonna sit. Uh, because you've already done three or four times. If, if it doesn't, you could turn the, keeping your body square to the dog sometimes is a, is a communication that will help. So you turn to face the dog down, sometimes makes the dog sit. And if it doesn't sit, then you just move on to something else. You stop the activity. There's no punishment, there's no re retribution, there's no correction. It's just you do what I want and we keep on going. If you don't do what I want, it just stops going. And you don't get the reward, the behavior that you want at the end of the pre -mac. So we talked about doing that. Uh, so for, uh, so uh, for the uh, leash, going back to the leash, again, first stage is just reaching for it, and eventually I should be able to reach the whole way and the dog stays in a sit. Then I pick it up. When I pick it up, the dog gets up, I put it back down. Anytime the dog doesn't do what you want, you stop the activity, tell them what you want them to do. If they do it, then you continue. If they don't do it, you go back and sit down, and you do something else. Uh, so eventually, you'll be able to pick it up. The next one is, is picking it up and jiggling it, and then reaching towards the dog and eventually attaching it. And so eventually you've taught the dog how to behave for all the, acti uh, all, the, all the steps of the activity. And when you don't do what I want, then I stop the doing the activity. That's why it's helpful to practice leashing your dog up when you're not planning to take your dog out for an exercise or for a walk because it doesn't get the validation afterwards and you don't have the artificial pressure on your shoulders. Remember for walks, we put the pressure because we had a timeline? No, take that time on off. One of you has to go to the bathroom, pause the TV, and practice. the other person practices putting the leash on, putting the food in the bowl, or whatever the case may be. There's a lot of opportunities for a pre mac so look for those. Those are great ways to help start shifting that leader-follower dynamic so the dog sees, I have to do something for the human to get something I want. And that will help the dog be more obedient um, and listen better and want to listen better. We also talked about petting with a purpose and passive training. Petting with a purpose is, is petting your dog for a reason. Most of us pet our dogs for the wrong reason. It jumps up, we pet them. Um, it nudges us, we pet them. Well, nudging is telling you what to do. Leaders tell, followers ask. So your dog tells you what to do and you do it, then the dog thinks, yes, I'm in charge of that person because when I tell them what to do, they do it. So next time the dog nudges you or paws you, tell her to sit. If she sits, pet her, say sit, and then start reaching under and petting her under her chin. Really, just say sit. If she sits within two seconds, then reach over and just pet her under her chin. Don't say anything else. Uh, remember the sandwich is you, you say the command word, the dog does the action, then they get the reward. And if you're using a clicker, you say the command word, when they do the action, they get a click, then they get the reward afterwards. Um, now, uh, for passive training, well, we'll talk about that in a second, I'm not there yet. So, uh, for petting with a purpose, the dog comes and nudges me, I tell it to sit, if it sits, I pet it on its chin, and I pet it for as much as little as I want. If it doesn't sit, I show the dog, I have 12 other things I could be doing, I'm not, I'm not gonna yell at you, I'm not mad at you, but it doesn't bother me at all, I got other things I can do, I'm living my best life. The dog is the one that's losing out. After a while, the dog will recognize, I can't tell the humans what to do, I have to ask, and better than ask, I have to pay them for the privilege of their attention. The dog will start coming and sitting in front of you to prepay for that attention. Make sure you pet for that. Um, uh, now, remember to use the watchword of paycheck. If someone's petting without a purpose, you say paycheck, the person stops petting, even if they did it right, tell the dog to sit. If it sits, you pet her on the chin, and say, actually, I asked the dog to sit, and when you stood up, he did something else. Um, and I continue, but thank you, because it's not a gotcha. And even if you want to pet the dog, you still tell the dog to sit, and if it doesn't sit, it doesn't get the attention. If it does, then you do get the attention. Um, tell it to sit or lay down. I wouldn't recommend asking for paw. That confuses a lot of dogs. Um, we also talked about passive training, which is what I stopped myself from before. Now, I'm gonna talk about that in two different ways. Now, when we're first learning something, we can have a lot more latitude and not be as precise. Um, and so for the learning things, when you're translating things, uh, what I would do is every time the dog comes to you, I didn't say the word come when it gets to you. 
if you can anticipate it and say come right before it gets to you and then start petting it afterwards, that's better. But at first you might miss it. So I'm watching TV, the dog comes and sits down next to me, I miss it, my partner says celebrate, I turn and start petting the dog and I would say, and I would say sit. Now technically I'm late, but that's we're just starting the process. So we need to teach her what it means without being, saying it in German words. So basically after a while, when she comes over to you, you need to be more observant. When she comes and she's about to sit, then you say sit right before the butt hits the ground. And as soon as the butt hits the ground, they start petting her or give her the treat. And after a while, she'll understand sit means sit down and get a reward. And she'll be happy to do that. So try to do that for sitting, coming, and laying down. Uh, but you can also do it for eating food. When she's about to take her first bite of food, say uh, enchilada. Before she uh, goes into her kennel, um, say palace. Come up with a fun command word for all these things. Um, so, um, you know, you put, I showed you how to do the CER to put her on the collar. And you probably won't have to do this part. Maybe you do that once, three or you know, maybe two or three times and hold it for her to touch it. Then just start holding your hand out. Eventually, you just hold it out. She'll stick her head all the way through the collar. Then you give her the treat afterwards. Uh, but before you give her the treat, so you, you hold up this up and you know that she knows how to do it. Then you would say the word. If she doesn't know to do it, as soon as her head goes all the way through it, then I would say uniform or dress up. Then I would give her the treat. But eventually, I would want to get to the point where I'm saying uniform or dress up. She does the action, then she gets the reward. And that's the best way of uh, connecting the dots and making the dog motivated. If I do this, I get that. Um, and uh, let me see. So. Um, we see, we talked about this, uh, the videos above, I'm not gonna talk about. We went over the CER. Um, we also went over playing catch. So remember, I have one of you sitting next to the dog. And again, exercise the dog a little bit ahead of time. The dog, and don't throw it three times, go, or wind up three times, just go throw it. And if it goes in the dog's mouth, after it goes in the mouth, say catch. This is one where we have to probably say it after because we don't know if it's gonna bounce off. And we say catch and it bounces off, it's gonna confuse the dog. So this one, I would just say catch every time it goes in their mouth. Um, if it, it bounces, then the person sitting next to the dog picks it up and gives it to uh, the other person, and they throw it again. Now, I'd also like you to go to the green spot and get a bag of bully sticks, six-inch bully sticks. And once a day, I'd like you to pull out a bully stick, hold it. Remember, if I have it, it's mine. The dog has it, it's hers. If we both have it, then it's ours. So you're holding it, and she's chewing on it. And let her chew onto about a quarter of it, and then let it go. You can also uh, put one in her, like I talked about in the video above, zip it on the back of her kennel. Uh, now, I didn't go over this with you in person, so I want to go over this with you now real quick. So what I want to do is I'm holding the street, and I want to do the first, first maybe one or two bully sticks. You're just holding it, letting her chew on it, no touching. Eventually, what I'd like to do is, let's say this is the dog's mouth and this is its tail. So um, it's facing this way. I'm holding a bully stick. I'm going to reach over with one finger, and I'm going to touch her hip with one finger while she's chewing it. And if she takes her, if she stops chewing it, we leave it there for a second, and if she stops chewing for like two seconds or longer, then pull your hand back. Let, when she goes back to it, let her chew for a second or two, then touch her hip. You want to keep doing this until so eventually you touch her hip and she's like, eh, whatever, it keeps on chewing. Once she gets to that point, then uh, you uh, touch with two fingers. And then she, you keep on doing that until you get to your whole hand that you can touch on her, and she stays calm and she just keeps on chewing. Then you start rubbing in slow little circles or giving her a little massage while she's chewing it. Again, I have it. She has it, now we both have it, so we're, it's ours, so she's not growling at you. And now you're starting to pet her, but you're doing it way over here on her hip. Gradually, and this is gonna be many, many practice sessions, eventually you get to the point where you're under her chin while she's chewing on it, she's completely comfortable because you desensitized her for it and helped her feel comfortable. Now, there's another thing you could do that we I forgot we didn't go over. She doesn't like having her paws touched. It's normal for a lot of dogs. A lot of times it's augmented because we trim the nails and we cut in the quick and it hurts. So what I want you to do instead is kind of a CER of what I did before. So she's on the floor, let's say her paws are right here and I have to move my hand. So let's say the paws are still here the whole time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna reach for the paw without touching it. And if she gets still or bears her teeth or any of that stuff, you push too far. So reach maybe 75% of the way towards it just with your hand and then pull your hand back, then give her a treat. And then do that about three, three or four times where if the hand paws here, you're going here, pulling it back, and then she gets a treat. And eventually you get to the point where you go touch, pull it back, and give her the treat. Then touch, give her the treat. Touch, give her the treat. Four fingers, touch, give her the treat. So eventually you get to the point where you should be able to hold the hand, and then she gets a treat. The guardians here uh, were trying to do some of the things that she was biting at them. And I talked to a client on the phone earlier, I don't know if she's gonna be a client, but she's like, I can't put it on gloves, the dog keeps on biting me. The dog's biting you, it's saying it doesn't like what you're doing. You should stop long before they start biting you. 
So uh, remember, look for your dog's body language. Now we're probably gonna have Laura come back. So Laura, I want you to ask Laura uh, to go over, a, if uh, you do set up a session with her, let's start going over, can you tell me what her, you know, what a confident body mechanic is? And you can look at this yourself. What I, the hierarchy I look at, it, first of all, I look at the dog's overall, how they're carrying their weight. Is the weight underneath them? Are they leaning away from it or are they leaning towards something? Leaning away from it is probably more fearful, leaning towards something a little bit more dominant or, or aggressive. Um, and so basically, if the dog is on its kind of balanced, then, I, then the next thing I'm doing is looking at their head and their ears, or I'm looking at their breathing, or I'm looking at their tail. So every dog is a little bit unique. So you kind of, what I want you to do is look at Aurora when she is relaxed and look at what her tail does. Then uh, once you got a good feel, you know what her tail should look like when she's relaxed. Then when she's happy, what does her tail do? Does it wag at full slope all the way across? Does it go maybe just to the left? Does it go, is it higher, lower, whatever it is? So you start breaking down the tail, the overall, the first one is their overall body positioning. Second one is probably their breathing. Are they holding their breath or breathing heavy? She was breathing heavy a lot. That's a sign of stress. Um, and then also, what are the ears doing? More forward can be more assertive. More back into the side can be a little bit more accommodating or uh, going back can be fearful. Uh, and it's gonna be, there's a lot of nuance to it. So learning to read your dog's ears. When, when she's comfortable, confident, balanced, and neutral, her ears are like this. When she's like this, she's a little insecure. When they're like this, she's might be about to lunge. If she's like this, she's really aggressive. So when you start seeing those body parts move in different directions, the tail wags a certain way, you know which direction she's in and you can start getting her out of those positions. Remember, if she's reacted, the best thing to do is increase distance between her and whatever she's reacted to. Now I have videos for click for looks, and so you can find those. If you can't find those, message me. But um, I prefer that you pra don't practice click for looks in your courtyard really try to find a park that's nearby so it's not home turf. I think that home turf is gonna be an influencer and not, and not in your favor. Eventually, once she's established behavior, then we would like to have her practice in here so we can extinguish that reactive behavior and have her comfortable. But remember, walking with other dogs is a great way to do this. Um, uh, and you might have to be really far apart, like on the other side of the street. The idea is we're all parallel. So nobody's in front, nobody's behind. We're all kind of on the same line, but we have enough distance between where the dog doesn't have to feel threatened or the pressure. All right, well, um, this is uh, probably probably go on for more and more stuff, but uh, I think we uh, covered a lot here. Um, oh, oh, a couple of dog psychology things. Remember, yeah, dogs do repetition. They learn through repetition, consistency, and good timing. You have two seconds to correct a word of dog for them to make that connection. But every time we're inconsistent, that really slows down and frustrates the dog. Also, good attention and bad attention for dogs is pretty similar. Um, and anything your dog is doing when you pet it or give it attention is what you're rewarding. So when you come home, if your dog jumps up on you and you pet it, you're saying, I like you jumping up on me. So when you come home, when she jumps up on you, like I said, instead of doing the pulling up your knees like they do at that dog daycare, when she jumps up on you, cross your arms across your chest and freeze and look at the ceiling and become the most boring. Be still, don't move. When she jumps down, then tell her to sit or lay down. And if she does those things, then pet her. So what you're saying is when you jump up on me and become boring, when you get down, if you do something that I want, I will give you my attention. And after a while, she'll start doing that. And she'll start prepaying for the attention if you're doing the passive training, the petting with purpose, all the rest of that stuff. Um, let me see. Uh, also remember dogs probe to find out where that boundary of the limit is. They're testing you. They're not probing to be defiant. So don't interpret that as dogs being naughty. The dog is learning. So, um, and remember, anything that you, the dog does in your presence that you don't disagree with is looked at as have my seal of approval. So the dog's trying to get on that carpet. The one time that you're not paying attention and it gets on, it thinks that's where the doorway is. So instead, make sure you're very consistent. Remember, these rules should be in place for, and for at least 90 days to jumpstart and get the dog in a habit of doing those things. Now, if you have questions or problems, please hesitate. Call me, um, program my number on your phone, and text me. Text is the best way to reach me. If I don't care for me, hear from me, I, don't, I assume everything's going great. So I don't care if it's six years from now. If you have questions, you call or text me. If you don't, I will be mad at you. So I can't help you unless you let me know you need help. And I don't charge phone calls or texts. All right, this is Aurora's Roadmap to Success. Remember, nah, if I can talk properly, this is Aurora's Roadmap to Success. It's been a long day. Remember, everything you do trains your dog. Only sometimes you mean it.